Please turn to Mark 14 as we continue studying Jesus' final days. Thank you, choir. Another home run from you, which we now expect every week, don't we? I think it was the great philosopher Bill Murray who said there are two kinds of people in the world. Remember what they were? You don't remember? Two kinds of people in the world? It's, uh, Heath might say the two kinds, those that love banana pudding and those that don't. <laughs> Bill Murray said there are two kinds, those that love Neil Diamond and those that hate Neil Diamond. You remember that? Anyway, I don't know about that, but I do know on a more serious note that the Bible teaches there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those that love the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are those that hate him. And you may think some are apathetic or some are indifferent. That's just simply another form of hatred. And we've seen these two kinds of people in recent days as we studied Jesus' last days and now down to his last hours, actually. We've seen the uh, uh, religious leaders and so forth that uh, were planning and plotting and scheming and dreaming for his uh, death for quite some time now. In sharp contrast with the extravagant love, affection, and devotion from the two women, uh, one who gave her last penny and the other who anointed Jesus with very expensive perfume. Last week, uh, Pastor Heath led us through Gethsemane and Jesus' anguish, ang anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Gethsemane was normally a place of refuge uh, for the Lord, but not on this occasion, as it ended with his betrayal and uh, arrest, and even before his arrest, uh, you remember how the disciples were so weak that they could not watch and pray with him uh, for one hour in his uh, moment of distress. Gardens have a significant place in the Bible, and uh, all the trouble started in the first garden, the Garden of Eden. and. Uh, all the sin and misery that came out of that garden and the consequences thereof led to the anguish of the Lord Jesus in this garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's pray. We'll look at today's text. Father, we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is King, and we rejoice in his person and work and his station, King of kings and Lord of lords, and we give thanks for those sweet injuries that he suffered because of our rebellion, sinfulness, wickedness. We thank you that he showed the full extent of his love, that he set his face to go to Jerusalem and, and even to Calvary to die for our sins and later to rise for our justification. So help us walk with him to the cross and enter into his uh, anguish and suffering uh, this morning that we might know afresh these sweet injuries, and that we might experience afresh the full extent of his love for his people. So help us to that end, we pray, through Christ our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew 14, beginning in verse 43. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. <clears throat> all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. 
But the word of our God stands forever. Amen. What we have here is a dismal picture of human nature. Comprehensive failure uh, all around. As the mighty love of God approached its greatest work and was about to be displayed in supreme magnificence, there was a corresponding outbreak of sin and evil, of wickedness and weakness. And we begin, first of all, by looking at the corrupt collusion. We hear a lot about collusion these days, or we we did in recent days. Verse 43, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. I believe it's John's gospel, John's account, that in the original version, uh, Greek language uses the word cohort to describe the Romans. A cohort consisted of about 600 soldiers. Chances are this group was not that large. But don't think it was a small committee either. In fact, Matthew's account tells us it was a great crowd that came to seize him. And as we read the other accounts, we know they came with lanterns and torches to arrest the light of the world. And here we read they came with swords and clubs to arrest the Prince of Peace. The Romans always feared an insurrection. And uh, indeed, if you take a sneak peek ahead to the next chapter, you find that there had been an insurrection fairly recently, and uh, a killing or some killings had taken place, and one murderer had been arrested. You remember his name? Barabbas. And he will play prominently uh, in the near future, of course. So the Romans were here to present an insurrection, a riot. Judas... Judas was the insider that was needed for this dastardly deed to be pulled off. But the real leaders who had been thinking and plotting about this for quite some time were these chief priests and the scribes and the elders, people that would not have struck us as bad people. Indeed, just the opposite, they would have struck us as good people, uh, religious people, and not just religious people, but religious leaders, well-respected in their community, church members, synagogue members, who loved their mothers and who didn't kick their dogs, and yet with premeditated malice, they carried out the most heinous sin that has ever been committed in the history of the world and all the while they did it convinced that they were in the right. They trampled on justice, they paid a traitor, they bore false witness and all the while they were convinced they were in the right. C.S. Lewis once wrote, the greatest evil is not done in those sordid dens of crime that Dickens loved to paint. It is not done even in concentration camps and labor camps. In those, we see its final result. But it is conceived and ordered, moved, seconded, passed, carried, minuted in clean, carpeted, warmed, and well-lighted offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voice. You get the point, I guess. This dastardly deed was conceived by respectable, educated, refined, religious leaders who should have been among the first to rejoice in the advent of the Savior. 
but whose jealousy and envy and insecurity led to this wicked plot. These were not barbarians. These were not savages. Pascal once said, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious convictions. The corrupt collusion. Secondly, we see the the disciples' demise, verses 44 and 45. Now the betrayer, that would be Judas, had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Remember now, it was dark. And these Roman soldiers that had come to arrest Jesus had, in all probability, never seen him up close. There were no photographs. Jesus' picture wasn't hanging in the post office anywhere. And so Judas had arranged a signal, a signal whereby he would identify Jesus, so they arrested the right man. By this time, Judas had his paltry 30 pieces of silver which was the ransom price for a slave. And as he led the corrupt collusion to Jesus, he went up and followed through on his word. He he feigned honor. He feigned respect. Rabbi! And then the kiss. And it wasn't just any kiss. It was a katephileo. You're familiar with phileo, brotherly love, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Some say it's a city of brotherly shove, I don't know. But this was more than phileo, this was kata phileo, fervent, passionate, affectionate kiss, reminiscent of the prodigal son's father who ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him all over and said, let's kill the fatted calf. That's the kind of affection that Judas displayed, nauseating affection, I might add. This was wickedness cloaked in pious gestures, sickening. And by the way, we'd have thought Judas very religious too. How did Mark identify him? Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve. Why does he tell us that? We, we know he's one of the twelve. Do we need to be reminded he was one of the twelve? Matthew does the same thing. John does the same thing. Judas, one of the twelve. Judas, one of the twelve. Judas, one of the twelve. So we never forget that he was one of the 12, as though the gospel writers are saying, can you believe it? Can you believe this man who was so close to Jesus, who left all to follow him, who heard all the sermons and saw all the miracles and experienced all the love and grace and compassion and who himself personally benefited from Jesus' ministry, one of the 12 betrayed his blessed Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been betrayed by someone at some time in your life. You know it hurts. It stings. It's always someone close, someone you least expect, one of the 12. And betrayal is as old as as man. Abel was betrayed by his brother Cain. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Samson was betrayed by Delilah. The great King David was betrayed by his trusted counselor, a man named Ahithophel. And even the Son of God was betrayed by Judas, one of the twelve. But it wasn't only Judas that failed. So did Peter. And we'll see more of his failure in the coming weeks. Verse 47 But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. John tells us that 
this one was Peter. I don't know about you, but I've always been impressed at how good Peter was with the sword. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's cutting it pretty close. You know, he just, just got the ear. And isn't that, doesn't that impress you? Of course, the truth is he was probably going for the head. And he missed. Or the man ducked or the man leaned or something, but he got the ear. And he also got a quick rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ. who said, put that thing away. And he healed that man's ear right then and there. While he's being betrayed, one more act of power, grace, compassion. A man who'd come to arrest him, but he healed that man's ear instantaneously. Not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drum, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Peter had the wrong sword. This is our sword, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> this word, <clears throat> above all earthly powers, sharper than a two-edged sword. So Judas failed, Peter failed. Verse 50, they all failed. They all left him and fled. Courage was in short supply. Not a single one of them that would stay with him. Not a Bilbo Baggins among them. You remember Bilbo Baggins, a little hobbit, Tolkien's character, and he was in a tight spot. Go back. No good at all. Go sideways. Impossible. Only one thing to do. On we go. And Tolkien says he got up and he trotted along with his little sword in front of him and his hand leaning against the wall and his heart all of a pitter and a patter. Jesus was the only one who went on alone. His heart all of a pitter and a patter. Everybody else ran for their lives. All you saw were heels and elbows if you happened to be there looking. Comprehensive failure. Chief priests, scribes, elders, Judas, Peter, all the disciples, all of them, we'd say, good people, religious people, religious leaders. Who can you trust? You know what the Bible says about Jesus. He didn't trust anybody. He entrusted himself to no man. Why? He knew what's in the heart of man. We ought to be reminded <clears throat> that the visible church has often been an enemy of the true church. That the visible church is often entertained and then embraced and then propagated false teaching and when the true church comes along or some representative of the true church comes along and calls the visible church the false church to repentance what happens the false church doesn't like it they resent it they get mad we don't read the book of Amos very often. Amos was a fig picker from Tekoa. God called him to be a prophet. He was a faithful prophet. You remember who gave him trouble? The priest. <laughs> Amaziah. Said, Go home, prophet. The land can't bear your words. Go back to where you came from. John Huss called the church to repentance and they burned him at the stake for it. The English martyrs of the 16th century and the Scottish martyrs of the 17th century, they have similar stories. Dr. Machen, early 20th century, was excommunicated by the Presbyterian church for daring to complain that the money that was going to support missionaries was supporting missionaries who didn't believe the gospel. 
Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge was a dead church until Charles Simeon came along and he preached the gospel and for 50 years that church grew and flourished and there was life and then he died <clears throat> and within one generation after his death the liberal vicar sent a university professor to preach and he preached all the wrong things as you might expect and an old faithful Sunday school teacher just couldn't bear it and so he resigned how did the liberal vicar respond he said I could barely control my amusement it's just comedy comedy for him well there was a corrupt collusion the disciples failed everybody failed except one Amen. I think he knows what's coming next <laughs> the submissive savior who went on alone. Verses 48 and 49, Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the Scriptures be fulfilled. His meat and drink was to do the Father's will from the very beginning. And if you remember when Peter tried to stop him, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Being translated, I've got a job to do. He was tough. And Jesus offered that bloody prayer in Gethsemane and said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Let the scriptures be fulfilled. Let Zechariah 11 be fulfilled right down to Judas taking that paltry 30 pieces of silver and throwing it back into the temple, which he did after the dastardly deed was done. Let Psalm 2 be fulfilled. Let the people's plot and the kings of the earth take their stand. Let Zechariah 13 be fulfilled. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will run for their lives. Let Isaiah 53 be fulfilled. He was to be a despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, numbered among the transgressors, right down to every last detail. His meat and drink was to do his Father's will, die for our sins and rise for our salvation. He could have called down 12 legions of angels. That would have been 72,000 angels to deliver himself. He had that power. All he had to do was say the word or snap his fingers. You know, back in the Old Testament, one angel slaughtered 185,000 Assyrians. Don't you think 72,000 angels could have handled the situation here? Obviously so. But let the scriptures be fulfilled for your salvation. Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov said, <clears throat> said it well. I believe there's nothing lovelier, deeper, more sympathetic, and more perfect than the Savior. I say to myself with jealous love that not only is there no one else like him, but that there could be no one. There is in the world only one figure of absolute beauty, Christ. That infinitely lovely figure is, as a matter of course, an infinite marvel. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are the fairest one of all that you shine fairer and purer and uh, brighter and purer than all the twinkling starry hosts. So we do cherish you and 
honor you for that lonely road you took, that courageous path to Calvary. And we give you all glory and honor, praise and adoration, for you are worthy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.